Hey, good to see all of you. Uh, uh, the, the Unify LA thing is going to be really fantastic. Let's come out and hear Nick Vujicic. He is a, a very gifted evangelist, has spoken to more than a billion people around the world. And because he has no arms and no legs, he has a story to tell that very few can tell. And um, it's going to be absolutely riveting. Mark is just doing a fantastic job organizing this thing. We want to fill up the Staples Center. And this Roxy said, if you buy one ticket, and it's really for the game, and then you stay afterward for this, this Unify LA event, which starts at 5 o'clock, but if you buy one ticket, we'll give you one on the condition that you give that to somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ, and then bring them to that event. Okay, bring your dad to that event if he doesn't know Jesus. It's, it's, abs- it's going to be absolutely amazing, all right? If you, if you bu- don't buy that, and then you know, invite your spouse to that, because you know, if your spouse comes and says, oh, we're going to get free ticket. No, no, no. It's just for you invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus. That's what that is all about, okay? Well, are you familiar with the game show, The Price is Right? Are you familiar with that show? It's, it's been on for, forever and ever and ever. The, the, the game involves several contestants, and, and uh, they're, they're called out of the audience, and then they uh, have to, the object of the game is to try to guess the price of a number of different products and goods, and the contestant who comes closest to guessing the name of that or the, the price of that product without going over wins, can win a lot of money. Well, today I thought we would begin this uh, message by having a little, by playing our own little South Bay version of The Price is Right, all right? So if you've seen the show, you know the show, the audience really gets into this whole thing and they start cheering and they whoop it up and everything like that and they cheer for their contestants and the whole thing and of course they're trying to guess the name or the, guess the price of the product and I'm going to give you a a few products up here, but no cheating. Don't go on Google and try to figure out the price of the product, you know, and then yell that out to, to the contestants up here, right? So first of all, I'm going to need three volunteers up here. So, uh, so, so here we go, all right? Chris Chen, welcome to The Price is Right. Come on down. You're the first contestant on The Price is Right. There's Chris Chen. Hey, we didn't tell him he was going to do this. I want you to know that. Mark Suhu, you're the next contestant on The Price is Right. Come on down. Give him a big hand. Oh, my God. Kathy Kamaho, come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. Come on down. All right. Is that cool? We did not tell them that they were volunteering to do this. And boy, did we get... We got three live ones, I'm telling you, just like that, right off the bat. All right, so this is Mike Suhu, this is Kathy Carvajo, this is Chris Chen, all right? So I'm going to put four or five products up here on the screen, and, and get up a little closer, or just kind of get right behind me here, so, and Chris, get over here so we can, yeah, why don't you get right over here so we can see you. And so you're going to have to guess the price of this particular product, all right? So the first item, take a look at this, is a Starbucks Grande Ice Caramel Macchiato with soy, with tax, with tax, wait, 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 with tax, how much is it? All right, you guys cheer for Mike, you guys cheer for Kathy, you guys cheer for Chris, of course you can cheer, okay, so, all right, Mike, all right, what is the price of the caramel macchiato with soy, grande, Starbucks, with tax? Uh, uh, Gary, I think I'm going to go with $4.35. <laughs> All right, 435. Remember that 435. All right, here is here's Kathy. 436. Okay. Five dollars and ten cents. Five dollars and ten cents. All right, Chris Chen. Right, help him out here. What's all right? What, what size is it? It's a grande. Grande. You sure? Five dollars, guys? Are you really? What was yours again? Five. Five ten. Five, ten. 435, 510. 445. 445. 445. 445. All right, so we have 435, 510, and is that right? And 445. Oh, hey, that's really good. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. The price, the price of the Starbucks Grande Ice Caramel Macchiato with soy with tax is 455. All right. That means, Chris, you're the winner of the. And you get absolutely nothing. Okay, second product. Here's the second product, all right? 
All right, that's pretty good. Get up a little close. Okay, second product. Here it is right here. A premium pass to Disneyland. All right, premium pass. Okay, we'll start over here, Chris. Start over here. All right. All right, what are we going to say? 1,200. 1,200. All right, wait, is, that your, is that your final answer? 1,250? 1,200. One more again. That's it. 1,250. 1,250. All right, 1,250. We can put that up. Okay, this is... All right, Kathy. Let's go 700. 700. Okay, what was it again? 1,250. 1,250. 700. 700. And Mike Suhu. All right, Gary. I'm pretty sure I got this right in the pocket. I'm going to go with uh, 701. 701. All right. All right, the price of a premium passport to Disneyland is 779. Mike, you win. Okay. You do not get a premium pass as a prize. Okay, here's your next item. An Apple 42mm 18 karat yellow gold case watch with a black classic buckle. All right, brand new Apple watch, just like this one, but this is a cheap one. All right, all right, Kathy, we'll start with you. All right, Wait, Kathy. What is it? I have no idea. Okay, this is a, this is a 17,000. This is a smart looking watch. It is classy, it is techy. Any others? <laughs> Seven, 17,000. 17,000. Okay. What is this again? It's, a, it's an Apple 42 millimeter 18 karat yellow gold case watch with karat. a black classic buckle. Are you sure? Confident? 1,500? What do you say? I'll go with Rome. Okay. 2,000. 2,000. 2,000 dollars it is. Okay, Mike, what is this Apple watch going for? You know, the funny thing is, I just bought an Apple Watch for my father Father's Day week. I didn't, like my whole family. This thing's freaking expensive. But um, I'm thinking... <laughs> Be careful what you're saying, church. I know. Okay. Free. Uh, it's, it's funny expensive. Um, it's, I think <laughs> okay, it's... That's, that's better. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with... Let's see. I didn't get the whole gold stuff, so I have okay. to add a little. I'm going to go with 999. $999. Is that a lucky number? 999. Yeah, nine hundred ninety-nine dollars, and yours was two thousand. Two thousand, okay, Chris Chen. Uh, I've heard from a dollar to seventeen thousand. Seventeen thousand and one. Seventeen thousand. Seventeen. Two thousand and one dollars. All right. Jerry Roberts. All right, you gotta get up here. All right, what do you, what's your final answer here? Uh, there it 14. Is. 14. Now you're going with 14. Thousand. 14 Wait, thousand. Wait, it has gold though, right? It's gold. How Four much carats? How many carats? 14 carats. Four then 14,000. 14,000. 14,000. All right, 14,000. 999, 2,000, 14,000. And the answer is $15,000. You win. All right. That's crazy. That's crazy. Very, very expensive. All right, fourth item. Fourth item right here. Tuition and fees at Pepperdine University for one year. All right, information, the information is published in U.S. News and World Report, latest edition. Pepperdine is considered the preeminent undergraduate school in Southern California. Only the smartest people go there. All right, architecture is Mediterranean. The education is premier, Christ-centered, and personal. I know because I've been there. All right, so Mike. Does what, it include room and board? Doesn't include room and board. Tuition and fees for one year, Pepperdine University, according to US News and World Report. And fees. All right, guys, what do you think? Oh, I like that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with uh, 49,000. 49,000. Okay, 49,000. Okay, Kathy, what do you say? 49,000. 65? Am I hearing 65? 35? 35? Okay. I'll go, what'd you say, Hugh? 49,000, right? I don't know. I'll go. You said 49. <laughs> oh, it's getting dirty up here. What was that? Okay, I'll go with. Um, it's at least, USC is about 50. I say 60,000. 60,000. Okay, Chris? What do you got? Well, Pastor Gary, uh, I'm going to go with $1. What? $1. Okay, $1. so one, 
hey, that's pretty low. <laughs> that's kind of a low blow fact. Hey, I mean, if they go over, I win. Okay, right? all right, all right. One dollar, all right, 60000 49000 and the price of tuition fees for one year at Pepperdine University is 46692 Chris, you win again. All right, very good. Sorry I can't send you to Pepperdine. What's that? You can't go over, right? Wait, 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 is that right? Yeah, yeah. Did I do that right? Because you were over and you were over, right? Is that right? Okay, all right, one last one. And this one is a video product. Take, take a look at this. This is a video product. Take, take a look at this. Okay, this is a life-size remote-controlled R2-D2 refrigerator. Just came out, the Japanese just came out with it. Actually, it will be available on the market next year. All right, what's the price? R2-D2 remote-controlled refrigerator. I'm going to say... <laughs> oh, is this the whole go-over thing again? <laughs> <laughs> we're over. playing the still game. We're playing the same oh, game. I didn't. Okay, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Uh, Twenty-four thousand dollars. Twenty-four thousand. Twenty-four thousand dollars. Okay, oh, Kathy. Take that back no, then. no, no, no. I, I don't. Okay, Kathy. Okay, okay, I'll go last. Okay. Oh, my turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you Chris is gonna go. Okay, you, you go next. We have twenty-four thousand. I see four dollars. Four dollars. Four hundred. Thousand. Four thousand. Four thousand. Four thousand. Four thousand. Okay. What was yours again? Twenty-five. Twenty-five thousand, right? Four thousand. Okay. And what is he? Twenty-five. Uh, twenty. Twenty-five thousand and one. Twenty-five thousand and one. I don't know. You said. Did he say twenty-four thousand? Is that what he said? Twenty-four thousand. Twenty. You said twenty-four thousand. Twenty-four thousand. 25,001, I don't know why you didn't go 24,001, and 4,000, and the answer is we don't know because they haven't put a price on it yet, but I'd pay an arm and a leg for that. Hey, give our contestants a big hand. Thank you so much, you guys. You know, uh, there, is, there is one more product. There's one more price is right question that I have, and this one is for all of you, all right, and, and it's this one. What does it cost to follow Jesus Christ? What does it cost to follow Jesus? Now, we know what it cost him so that we can follow him, but what does it cost us to follow him? Now, some, if you took a survey in church, some people would say, well, it doesn't cost us anything. Jesus paid it all. Salvation is free. The gift of eternal life is free. That's what we've taught, right? And that's true, but it's not entirely true. It's not completely true. I mean, it does cost us something, to follow Jesus. I mean, there is a price to pay to follow Jesus. Now, if you're joining us for the first time today, we've been in this series called Really, and we've been looking at some scriptures, and we've been asking that one, sing, that single word question, an important question, really, and that is, do you really, really believe what it says? And we've been, we've been challenged by what we've learned so far. It is, you know, it's, it's a challenge to look at some of these things and say, do we really believe what this says? And it's important that you believe, because if you really believe it, then it's going to change the way you live. It's going to change the way you, how you live out your life. Well, today I want to talk about one more very challenging subject. In fact, it, this, is a, this is a very tough subject to tackle today. We're going to look at some very difficult scriptures today. And again, the question that we must wrestle down is, do we really really believe what it says. All right, so before I tell you what it is, but Jesus said, I want to open up our time in a word of prayer. Okay, let's pray together. Father, thank you. It's, it's great that we can have fun together as a church and, and have a few laughs over something like something as silly as the price is right. But God, there's, there's also a very serious side of what we want to do this morning. And that is we want to open up your scriptures and ask the question, really, do we really believe what Jesus said about what it costs to follow him. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be all over us and, and working in us and working in me and speaking through me. Father God, because I know, I know that, that I am nothing, but you are everything. 
And I pray, Father, today your Holy Spirit would convict us, your, your word would convict us, and that we would leave, be, leave here changed lives, understanding the cost of what it means to follow you, and that we would be willing to pay that price no matter what it is. So, Father, thank you so much. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, all throughout his ministry, Jesus called on people to follow him. Wherever he went, he just called on people to follow him, for example. And by the way, in your Baywatch, there's a sheet, a green sheet, I believe. It's got verses listed there for you. Those are the verses we're going to cover today. You can open up your Bible. We're going to be in Mark, or Luke chapter 14 today, or you can look at the scriptures. But all throughout his ministry, Jesus called on people to follow him. For example, in Mark 1, Jesus called Simon uh, and his brother Andrew to follow him. Mark 1, 17 says that and Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Will you circle those two words there, follow me? It, it comprises a verse, I mean a verb rather, follow me. When he saw Matthew Levi, the tax collector, he called on him to follow him, Luke 5, 27, and it says, and after this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Will you circle follow me? When he found Philip, he said to him, Philip, Follow me, John 1, 43. Will you circle, follow me? Whenever Jesus called on someone to follow him, he was basically calling on them to become his disciple. Now, last week we learned about what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who is a learner. It is the Greek word mathetes. We, again, just for those of you especially who are new, we look at the Greek because the New Testament was written in the Greek and, and sometimes the Greek translation of the words is different from our English translation and we want to know what it really says. So, mathetes is Greek. And we learn that is, it is the word disciple, but it is also synonymous, a disciple is synonymous with someone who is a Christian. Now, the word Christian was never used by Jesus. The word Christian never appears in the Gospels. The, the word Christian first came to us uh, after the church came into existence in the book of Acts. If you look at Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, it says, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. All right, so circle disciples and circle the word Christians and tie them together. Notice that in this last sentence, they are linked together. It was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. In other words, disciples and Christians are one and the same, although we didn't get that word Christian until the book of Acts. Therefore, whenever Jesus called someone to be his disciple, he was calling on them to become Christians. That, in essence, is what he was doing. He was calling on them to become Christians. And the verb that Jesus used to get, them, get someone to follow him was just simply follow me. So he said, follow me. We'll put those three verses up here for you again. And every, whenever he said, follow me, he was using the present imperative form of the verb. And here's what that means. The present imperative form of the verb means that it was an ongoing command. In other words, you follow me and then you keep on following me. It wasn't, the idea was continuous action. This wasn't an idea where follow me and then somewhere along the way you can stop. No, it was follow me and then you keep on following me and you keep on following me. It wasn't just a one-time event. It wasn't just a prayer that he was trying to get people to say. He was, getting, he was trying to get someone to, to follow him for the rest of their lives. And that's what it means to be a Christ follower. It is to follow Jesus you start following him and you don't stop and you just keep going and going and going. It is a call to a lifetime, a lifetime of devotion and, and commitment to Jesus Christ. And there is a steep price to pay for following Jesus. Now, I have a confession to make. Now, I don't like talking about today's subject because it is extreme. I don't like looking at these verses today because it is extreme, it is, it, it is radical, it is kind of way out there. You see, I've never been about trying to talk someone out of following Jesus. I've always been about trying to talk somebody in to following Jesus. But if you look at these verses today, you'd almost get the sense that Jesus was trying to talk people out of following him. In fact, if you look at the totality of his message in the Gospels, you get the sense that he was trying to talk people out of following him. And Maybe that was because he didn't want a bunch of milk toast, lukewarm, half-committed, half-hearted, unenthused people to follow him. He wanted people who were fully devoted to him. And this passage speaks about that, and, it, and, and I don't really care to talk about it, but it's there, and you need to know about it. 
You know, not long, too long ago, I was at an outlet mall with my family, and I said, oh, this is good because I, I need some jeans. And so um, I, I, I saw the first, the first store that I saw was a Saks Fifth Avenue uh, store, and so I said, well, I've never been in the Saks Fifth Avenue. What kind of clothes do they have? I've never gone into a Saks Fifth Avenue because it just sounded a little too rich for my blood. And so I just said, well, let me go check it out. So I went, I walked into Saks Fifth Avenue there at the outlet mall, and and I went into the, marched into the men's department, the men's department area, and, and I looked for a rack of jeans, and there they were, and went and looked at the rack of jeans, and I came upon this pair of slim fit jeans. I like to wear the skinny jeans because they look really good on me, and uh, I'm kidding. And, uh, and, I, and, and I looked at the price, and I nearly fainted. $295 for this pair of jeans. $295 for this pair of jeans. You see, before you buy something, you count the cost right? Talk me, took me all of two seconds to count the cost. I bought two pairs. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I'm kidding. I would never pay, never pay $300 for a pair of jeans. And so I went to Target and I bought a pair of jeans for $24.99. You know, I could apply, I just figured I could apply the $300 toward that R2-D2 refrigerator, so that's why I didn't do that. But here's, here's what Jesus said about the importance of counting the cost if you want to follow him, let me, let me read this. I'm going to read the entire section to you, all right? The entire section to you so that you have some context. Starting Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. It says here, Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other, other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. These are tough words. These are, these are difficult words. And the nine verses that we just read go together. They go together. And to communicate the importance of counting the cost, Jesus used two analogies. The analogy of building a tower and the analogy of a king going to war. I used the analogy of buying a pair of jeans. He used the analogy of construction and, and of war. And he said, before you go take on a huge construction project, you got to count the cost to make sure that you have enough resources, you have enough funding to finish the project that you're going to start. Because otherwise, you start a project and you run out of money, you can't complete the project. And, and it's a little bit embarrassing. In the same way, if you're a king... And you're thinking about going to war. You're thinking about declaring war on somebody. You've got to count the cost and make sure that you have enough soldiers in your army. And you've got to make sure that you have enough military might to defeat that other army because you don't want to take your country to war and lose that war. And so he said, you've got to count the cost. Well, in the same way, what he was saying was, if we want to follow him, we've got to count the cost. We've got to count the cost. And the phrase that jumped out at me when I read this passage was, cannot be my disciple. That's what jumped out at me. You cannot be my disciple. Take a look at the end of verse 26. It says, underline it. He says, you cannot be my disciple. And then, and then it's found again in verse 27. Underline it. You cannot be my disciple. And then again at the end of verse 33, cannot be my disciple. Underline it. Three times Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, you cannot be a Christian. Why? Why can't you be a Christian? Why can't you be a disciple? Well, first, he said, you cannot be my disciple if you put others before me. Take a look at verse 26. We'll put that up here for you. I'll repeat it again. If anyone, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and, and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, the operative word here is hate. Now, in the Greek, the word hate doesn't mean hate in the way we know hate. In the Greek, the word hate carries with it the idea of loving less. It is not hate like we think of hate. It, is actually, it actually means loving less. 
And that makes sense because Jesus never spoke about hate. He never said we should hate each other. He always said we should love each other. He said, husbands, you need to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Parents are to love their children. Children are to honor and love their parents. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus only spoke about love, never spoke about hate. And so when Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he wasn't really meaning that we would hate, that we should hate the people who are closest to us, that we should hate our family members. No, that's not what he meant. What he meant was we, meet, we need to love them less than we love him. We need to love them less than we love him. In other words, we need to love Jesus more than we love our husband or our wife. We need to love Jesus more than we love our own children. We need to love Jesus more than we love our brothers or sisters. You know, I actually had to think about this when I was, uh, becoming, when I was considering Christianity at the age of 21. I'd grown up in a Buddhist home. I, just, I was a brand new student at Pepperdine University with the preeminent undergraduate a university here in Southern California. And, uh, and, and, and at Pepperdine, I was confronted with the, with the claims of Christ. You know, a bunch of students at, in Dorm 17 got together with me and started sharing Jesus with me. And I started thinking about this. And, and I got to tell you, the idea of Jesus Christ being the Son of God, coming to earth to die on a cross for my sins, made so much sense to me. It just made so much sense to me as a 21-year-old that I started to think, I think this is what I want to do. I think I want to become a Christian. And I inched closer and closer to making that decision. And then these guys in my dorm, I'll never forget them, Doug, Doug Harriman and Duke Runnels and Dennis Lowe and, and, and they were about Terry Pickett. They, they, they said, hey, we want you to meet somebody. I said, sure. And so they introduced me to another student there on campus. Uh, his name was Alan. And I, I don't even remember Alan's last name. I, I wish I had his last name. But Alan was like me. He was another student there. We, Alan was like me. He was Japanese-American. He grew up in a Buddhist home. And about a year before there at Pepperdine, he also, he became a Christian. He gave his life to Christ. And when he went home to tell his parents about his decision, his dad gave him an ultimatum. And he basically told Alan, you must renounce your faith in Christianity or you are not my son. And you must leave this house. You know what Alan did? He left the house. He left the house and he was disowned by his parents. He left. As I said, I don't, I don't know whatever happened to Alan. I, Alan finally had to drop out of school because he didn't, had no financial support from his family. I, I'd give anything just to reconnect with him one more time, just to talk about the influence he had on me. Because after hearing Alan's story, it made me have to think about, it made me think about calculating the cost of what it would, would be to follow Jesus Christ. I had to think about that. And I started to wrestle with it. And I started to think about, wow, what if my parents did that to me? What am I going to do? What if my dad says that to me? What if my dad says it's either, it's either us or Jesus? What am I going to do? And so I had to think about that. And after a whole lot of soul searching, I decided that I was going to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. That if my parents came back and said, no, you know what, you need to renounce it or you're out of here, then, then I, would, I would be out of there. Well, I became a Christian not long after that, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't give me that ultimatum, and I'm so thankful for that. They weren't happy that I became a Christian, but they didn't disown me, and eventually they came to know Christ as well. What about you? What about you? Do you love Jesus more than you love your own husband or your own wife? Do you love Jesus more than your own family? Do you love Jesus more than your own parents? Do you love Jesus more than your own friends? That's the kind of devotion that Christ demands of us, that we would love Him more than we love anybody else. So write this one down. I must choose Jesus over others. I must choose Jesus over others. And if you don't choose Jesus over others, then you can't be His disciple. This week... Vanity Fair published their July, its July issue featuring Caitlyn Jenner, formerly Bruce Jenner, on the cover. And, and probably most of you know that Bruce Jenner was the gold medalist in the decathlon at the 1976 Olympics. Recently, he revealed in an interview that he has been confused about his gender. He had been confused about his gender since he was, uh, since he was a little boy. 
and it has led him to feel ashamed, and it, it has led him to feel like he's had to live a lie, and it's made him feel very alone in life, and, and he said he still feels alone. So what are we to make of Caitlyn Jenner? What are we to make of it? What should our response be uh, to uh, someone who is transgender? And it's, some, it's, it's important that you be prepared for this because this is so out there and this is the, really the hot discussion, hot topic of the day wherever you go. You know, the other day I read a blog written by John Bloom who is the president of Desiring God, which is a ministry of Pastor John Piper. And, and this blog was about, about uh, our contribution to the cultural conversation. And I thought that what he wrote was, was truly sensitive and helpful, and I wanted to just share a couple of things that he said. But Alan, let's not put that up there yet, okay? First, first he said, first Bloom said, that we should respond with compassion. That we should respond with compassion. Now, compassion doesn't mean we compromise biblical truth. Comp- c- compassion means our hearts are broken for what he has gone through. We, we, our compassion means we, uh, our, our hearts are broken and goes out to him because of his plight. You know, my guess is that very few of us in this room, if any, can relate to his experience. Maybe, maybe there is somebody here who can relate to his experience. But even if we can't relate to his experience, we should be compassionate because even if you can't identify with his particular struggle, we all struggle with something. We all struggle with something because we are all broken and we are all flawed and we are all fallen people because of sin. And so compassion should be our first response to him. Second, we should respond in love to him. And I like the way Bloom put it, and now you can put that up there. Bloom wrote, Bruce Jenner and every person who deals with gender or sexual orientation disorders bears the image of God and has a priceless soul. I love the way he said that. Everyone, including Bruce Jenner, bears the image of God. He was made, he was created in the image of God, and God loves him. I mean, God God loves everyone regardless of what their struggles are. Whether their struggles have to do with some kind of sexual addiction, whether it has to do with their sexual orientation, whether it has to do with their confusion over their gender, whether it has to do with some kind of a drug addiction or their low self-esteem or some kind of a mental disorder or depression or who knows what it is. We can go on and on and on. But God loves all of these people and it is not our place to judge them. It is our place to love them. Now sadly... Most people automatically assume that Christians are bigots and they judge people who are different from them. And they automatically assume that simply because we believe, as Christ followers, we believe, because this is what the Bible says, that marriage is between a man and a woman, they automatically assume that since we believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, that we hate homosexuals. And that's ridiculous. That couldn't be further from the truth. That's like saying if you oppose, if we oppose the legalization of marijuana, which, which we should, you know, stand against, we should stand against the legalization of marijuana, that doesn't mean we hate people who smoke pot. We, 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 I've had friends, many friends who smoke pot, and I go, oh, I, you know what, legal pot is wrong, I, you're, you're out of here, I hate you. We don't say that. That's ridiculous. It, it's, just, it's like saying if you believe, if you believe, and I believe this, that all any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage is wrong, right? It's called fornicate. If you believe that, I believe that because that's what the Bible teaches. It is wrong. Does it mean that we hate people, couples who come to our church all the time who are living together? We hate you because you, no, of course not. That's ridiculous, right? We, we need to love each other. We need to correct that misconception that is out there. We're not bigots and we're not haters. We need to be lovers, and so we need to love. We need to love people. And that means you love with your words and you love with your deeds. And, and so don't be posting things on your Facebook page, for instance, that are hateful. Don't be sharing things that are hateful. We need to go out and share love with one another. And invite someone who is transgender or someone who is gay. Invite them to our church. Let them come so that they might hear about the love that God has for them. And then our third response should be prayer. It should be prayer. You know, Jenner said in this interview with Vanity Fair, he told the interview, he said that once the Vanity Fair cover comes out, I'm free. 
That's what he says. I'm free. He's not free. He's not free because the cover comes out. The only one who can set Bruce Jenner free, in fact, the only one who can set any of us free from our bondage to sin is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. Romans 7, verse 24 and 25, Paul wrote, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from, this bo- from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? Only Jesus can set a man or a woman free regardless of what it is they're in bondage to. And that's why Jesus came. He came to restore and he came to redeem and he came to save and he came to forgive and he came to redeem our bodies from this brokenness and set us free from this sin-plagued body of ours. And that's why we must pray. Not only for him, but we must pray for the people around us. We must, we must pray that, that Christ followers, some loving Christ followers would come into his life and, and speak truth into, into Bruce's life and point him to Jesus Christ. We have to pray that God will touch his heart and forgive him of his sins. Now, now go back to Luke chapter 14. I want to tie this all together here. But in verse 27, Jesus said, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. All right? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. As you know, the cross was an instrument of death. Jesus was crucified on a cross. He was nailed to a cross. And the phrase, bear his own cross, carries, carries with it the idea of carrying a burden or carrying some pain, bearing pain or bearing some suffering. And what Jesus was getting at when he said this was that you can't be a disciple of Christ if you aren't willing to carry your cross and bear the pain that is associated with following him. You can't be his disciple unless you are willing to bear the pain associated with following him. You know, when I worked at City Hall years ago, I was in my mid-twenties, I was a Christ follower, Um, and some of the people that I worked with thought I was a little bit of a freak because because I wouldn't go sleeping around uh, like many of them were. And I'll never forget a conversation I had with uh, one of my co-workers, I'll just call him Sam, it's not his real name, but one day Sam said to me, I don't get you, Gary. I don't understand you. You can have any woman you want. You can go home with someone tonight. Why are you laughing? I was, I was, I was hot back then, right? And I still, no, I'm just kidding. And he, this is, and he honestly said this. He, he honestly, he said, you can go home with anyone tonight. You can have anyone you want. You give me the word. I'll set you up. You can have some tonight. It's exactly what he said. And I said to him, gee, thanks, Sam. That's really nice of you, but I can't because I'm a Christian. And he just shook his head in disbelief. You know, I learned something really interesting that day about, you know, through my conversation with Sam. And that is the people who don't follow Jesus don't experience the same kind of temptations that people who do follow Jesus experience. They don't experience temptations like Christ followers experience temptation. I mean, what Sam offered me, to be really honest, was very tempting. Wow, I could have someone tonight. You can set me up tonight. I'm like, you know, tonight, wow, you know. It's like, that was tempting. But it wasn't a temptation for him because Because if he wants to have sex, he just goes out and gets it. And and again, I'm speaking in general terms because not everyone is like this. But but, um, if he wants to get high, he just goes out and gets high. If he wants to watch porn, then he just goes and watches porn. And if he blows up at somebody, blows his fuse, blows his stack, and, and he just wants to cuss up a storm and chew somebody, he just can do that. And if he's married to somebody and he gets tired of his wife, he can just dump her and get somebody else. And, and um, won't even feel guilty about it. Won't even feel bad about it. But if we do it, you know, we just feel horrible. We just feel horrible. And, and here's the point. It's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy being a Christian 
Because our lives aren't governed by what the world says. Our lives aren't ruled by the cultural standards that are out there. Our lives are governed by a higher standard. They're, they're, they're governed by the Word of God. Our, our lives are ruled by God's Word. And, and God demands of us a certain kind of behavior. He expects a certain kind of behavior out of His children. And that means, for example, that as Christ followers, we don't indulge in pornography even though we want to. And we don't get high on booze or anything else or pot or anything else for that matter, even though the desire is there too. And we don't sleep around even though we wish we could. And we don't chew people out just because everybody else does. And we don't dump our spouse because we're tired of them and go get a new one just because, you know, we're tired of the old one. And so we battle as Christ followers. We battle and, and we experience this titanic struggle within us. And when we fail, we feel terrible because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because we know that we're supposed to live differently. You know, being a Christian isn't easy. I hated being single. I battled with lust and temptation and loneliness and sometimes depression. You know, everybody gets married, but I'm not married. It was, it's tough. And that was the cross that I had to bear for being a Christ follower. And then there's Sam. He loved being single. He could have a different woman every single night. He didn't experience temptation. He was never lonely. He was never depressed. If he wanted something, he'd just go out and get it. You see, there's a price to pay for following Christ. You must bear your cross. You must bear the pain if you want to be one of his disciples. And if you want to be one of his disciples, you've got to choose Jesus over self. That's your next point. You've got to choose Jesus over yourself. You know, Bruce Jenner's situation is beyond tragic. It is beyond tragic. And my heart breaks for him. It is sad. But I believe, but I also believe there's hope for him. I really believe there's hope for him. If he is willing to bear his cross and choose Jesus over self. And for him, that might mean that he would have to live for the rest of his days the way God created him as a man, even though he feels like he's a woman. And, and that doesn't mean he's not honest with how he feels. It just means that even though he will struggle for the rest of his life, he's willing to bear the pain of following Christ and live in obedience to him. That's what it means. And if he and you and I are willing to bear a cross, that he will truly be set free and he'll be free indeed. So what about you? What is your cross? What cross must you bear because of the fact that you are a Christian? I hope that you'll choose Jesus over yourself. Now take a look at Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, the final verse. The final verse in these nine verses in this passage on, the count, on counting the cost of following Christ, verse 33 says, So therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Will you circle the word renounce and circle the word all? You know, in the Greek, the word renounce means to say goodbye to. To renounce something means to say goodbye to something or to forsake something. In the Greek, the word all means all. It means all. No, no heavy theological interpretation there. And so in this concluding section, Jesus said that unless you are willing to say goodbye to everything in your life, everything, all, then you cannot be my disciple. In other words, I must choose Jesus, your final point, I must choose Jesus over everything. Choose Jesus over everything in your life. You know, in his book, Follow Me, Pastor David Platt tells about these two young brothers. You know, when, when Pastor David Platt was speaking, when he was teaching at a house church, an underground house church somewhere in East Asia, he, he was speaking and he met these two young brothers. And on this particular day, he says he was teaching on the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We looked at this passage last week. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. He was teaching on this passage and he said specifically he was talking about baptism that day. And he says, after he was done, these two brothers said, we, we want to be baptized. And so he, he challenged them. He said, you, you realize it is illegal 
for you to be baptized and to be Christians in this country, in your country. And he wanted to make sure, Platt wanted to make sure that they understood the cost of being baptized. It's going to cost you dearly if you take the plunge. But they insisted, no, we want to be baptized. And so they stood up in this house church. And it probably looked just like this. They stood up and suddenly the room became silent. And uh, one of the pastors, a man named Jiang, Pastor Jiang looked at Lee, who was the oldest of the two. He was in his mid-twenties. And he asked him point blank, quote, Lee, are you willing to be baptized knowing that it may cost you your life? And Platt said with unhesitating resolve, Lee responded, I have already sacrificed everything to follow Jesus. Yes, I want to be baptized. And then Pastor Jiang turned to Juan. Juan was a teenager, and he, like Lee, had just come to faith recently. And Pastor Jiang asked Juan, point blank, Juan, are you willing to be baptized today knowing that it may cost you your life? And Platt, Platt said that with a slight quiver in his voice, Juan looked at the pastor and said, quote, Jesus is my Lord. Whatever he says to do, I will do. And with that, both men were baptized at the risk of being killed for doing so. And then here's what Platt said. As I watched these brothers identify with Christ through baptism, I knew that from this point forward, both of their futures would be completely different. They had given everything they were, everything they had, everything they would ever do, and everything they would ever be to Jesus. And they had completely and gladly surrendered their ways to God's will. You see, this is what it means to follow Jesus. That you are willing to surrender everything. That you are willing to give everything up because of Jesus. And to the ones who are willing to put Jesus ahead of others, and to the ones who are willing to put Jesus ahead of themselves by bearing their cross, and the ones who are willing to say goodbye to everything Jesus says to you, you can be my disciple. But to the ones who are not, Willing, you cannot. So let me ask you something. Do you love Jesus more than you love your own family and your own friends? Do you care more about obeying Him than you do about fulfilling your own wants and desires? I mean, will you joyfully live out the rest of your life as a single person if God never brings anyone into your life? Will you commit yourself to absolute sexual purity? No sex outside of marriage whatsoever, whether you're a heterosexual or a homosexual or a transgender, simply because as a single person you want to honor Christ. Will you say goodbye to all of your hopes and dreams, whatever they are, for the sake of Christ? Will you gladly give up all of your material possessions Sell all of your possessions and give it to the poor if Jesus asks you to do that. Will you vigilantly take care, protect, and guard your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Guard it by watching what you put inside of it, whether it's too much food or too much alcohol or whether it's smoke or porn or pot or drugs. Will you protect the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is you? Will you put... God first in every area of your life? Will you put him first in your school? Will you put him first in your home? Will you put him first with your family? Will you put him first with regards to all the recreational and fun things you do? Will you put him first with regards to your personal ambitions? Will you put him first with regards to everything in your life? And if you're dealing with emotional pain or physical pain or, or loss or illness, Will you continually entrust yourself to a faithful God even if your situation never turns around? Will you keep running back to him over and over and over again? And if you are an outcast and you don't have any friends at school or work or even in your own family because you are a follower of Christ, will you keep following Jesus anyway? Will you resolve from this day forward to be obedient to Christ and his, regard, and his word regardless of the cost? Those are the questions 
that we've got to wrestle down. And to all those questions, I hope the answer is, I will. I will. I will do those things. I will follow him. You know, the price of following Jesus is steep. It is steep. But if you ask me, no price is too high. No price is too high to pay to follow the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is our King. He is our Lord. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Son of God. And Jesus came to die on a cross for our sins, to save us, to redeem us, to reconcile us, to forgive us, to give us the gift of eternal life. There's no one like Jesus. No one like Jesus, amen? And that is why he's worth following, no matter what it costs. I hope you'll say amen to that. Let's close. I'd love for all of you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe, maybe you're like me. And there have been times when you have failed miserably. Failed. Because you haven't been willing to pay the price to follow Jesus. You've wanted your own personal desires and wants and ambitions more than you have wanted Him. Will you just take a moment just to ask Him to forgive you? Renew your relationship with Him. And then maybe there's some of you here today and you've been thinking about crossing that line of faith. Maybe some of you are here today and you've crossed that line of faith, but your, your Christianity is one of ease. It's one of comfort. It's about you. It's not about you willing to go all out for him. You know, I want to give you an opportunity to do something that we don't ever do here. And that is if you want to take a stand today, if you want to stand up for Jesus today and say, I, I am willing to pay whatever price I must pay to follow Jesus, if you're willing to say that, will you just stand up right where you're at? Just say, I am willing to do whatever you want me to do, God. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will pay whatever price you want me to pay. That's great. Anybody else willing to say that? Yeah, just stand up. That's fantastic. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I am willing to, to do whatever you want. I will pay whatever price. Is there anybody else who's willing to say that? Oh, it's a... Yeah, you're not standing up for me. You're, you're, you're letting him know, God, I will stand for you. Anybody else willing to say that? Just stand up. If God is moving in your heart, you're willing to pay that price. You keep standing. You keep standing if God is leading you to do that. And I'm just going to pray. Maybe you need to, maybe you haven't wanted to get baptized for whatever reason. You haven't been willing to take a stand because you're afraid or whatever it is. Just, will you just, if you want to get baptized, stand, take a stand and say, God, I, if that's what you want me to do, I will, I will do that for you. Anybody else? Oh, dear Father, you must be so, so pleased with and so thrilled that so many would stand here today to declare that they are willing to pay whatever price they must pay to follow you. And God, you never said, we, here in America, we preach this Christianity where it's supposed to be easy and where we're supposed to have health and wealth and everything is supposed to be perfect. But that's not what the scriptures say. That's not what life is all about. Life is such a struggle. Life is so difficult and it's particularly difficult if we know you because you want us to live by a certain standard and that's not the world's standard. And so there are all these pressures on us and we face all these temptations. But God, we come here today and we stand before you to declare we're, we're willing to pay whatever price we must pay. We're willing to bear our cross to follow you. So God, help us to do that. Give us the courage. Give us the faith. Give us the 
the fortitude to keep going on. Your call to follow was not a one-time call when we say a prayer and that's it, but it was a call of an ongoing commitment. God, today we commit ourselves to following you for the rest of our days and giving you everything that we have. So thank you, Father. Father, as we close, we, we, we pray for, for Bruce Jenner and for all those who struggle in ways that we can't even imagine. We ask, God, that you would touch them. And I pray that you will allow South Bay Community Church to be a beacon of light to all those who struggle, regardless of what their struggle is. Our hope is in you. You are our hope. There's freedom in, in you. Help us to proclaim Jesus wherever we go. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.